Welcome to the Dr. Digipol Show. It is a great day here in Washington, D.C. I'm Alan Rosenblatt, a.k.a. Dr. Digipol, and we are looking forward to a great show. We have some great guests with us today. Uh, we have Anita Jackson and Gloria Pan from Moms Rising. Um, just so uh, they know, we're going to be putting them up one at a time and uh, to say hello. Uh, but uh, just kind of an overview, what we've got here is um, we call this the virtual rise of Moms Rising. Moms Rising, one of the most uh, influential advocacy groups in the country uh, with millions of people in their audience and a long record of success in influencing public policy. And uh, we're going to hear from Anita Jackson who is, uh, runs their social media and uh, blog, and uh, Gloria Pan, who, uh, among other things, runs their child nutrition and also their gun safety uh, campaigns. Uh, I, if I bungled any of that, I'm sure they'll... Uh, so somehow our, our music just ran again. So we just got to hear me in a loop. And... Uh, uh, have to hit my mute over on the Facebook Live. If you are watching on Facebook Live, I know that some of you are, but if you are and you want to get involved in the conversation, go to the to the um, Dr. Digipol show link that's uh, provided on the Facebook page for Shindig, and that way you can actually uh, ask questions and get on camera if you want to ask the questions live or just submit them with uh, text uh, and become part of the conversation. So with that, I am going to first bring up um, Anita Jackson from Moms Rising. Hello, Anita. How are you? Hi, Alan. I'm doing well, thanks. It's How nice to see. You? I'm doing very well. It's uh, you know, we're we're uh, we're exploring the potential of this online uh, um, web show kind of format, and it's uh, mm -hmm. still very new. I think we're in episode seven out of. Uh, an initial run of 16, and we'll see how that's, this goes. But uh, welcome. Uh, why don't you tell us quickly, I know I, I said you do the social media and the blog, but what is your role at Moms Rising, and what is Moms Rising? That's a great question. It's a great question because when you talk about doing social media strategy, um, you know, it can run the gamut from people thinking you do tweets all day to, you know, who knows what. Um, and in an organization like Moms Rising, where we have multiple issues and multiple layers of campaigning going on all the time, um, it's something to describe how social media um, works uh, with all of that. So um, I, I try to be very clear that I'm the director of our social media strategy, because I think strategy is such an important piece of the work that gets forgotten a lot. Um, and, but I'll come back to that. I'll start by describing the organization. So Moms Rising is a million member online and on, on the ground grassroots organization um, that advocates for family economic security, um, you know, to advance women, moms, and families, decrease di discrimination against um, women and moms in the workplace and everywhere, and, um, and help build a nation where moms and women and families and businesses can thrive. Um, so we work on a range of issues uh, relating to wellness and family economic security, uh, healthy kids, um, and you'll hear from Gloria uh, some specifics on campaigns that we work on. Um, so as the director of social media strategy, um, I work to um, use the tools of social media to help us achieve our organizational and movement building goals. Um, so that could be everything from you know, public education, getting the word out about um, you know, certain policies, um, certain legislation, um, to using the tools to tell personal stories, um, to partnering with other organizations and using social media to amplify others' voices. Mm -hmm. um, that's just a, a, a quick overview of what it is. Um, I hope that's helpful. No, that, that's very, very helpful. And uh, um, just before we switch over to Gloria, and we'll, we'll, we'll go back and forth between the two of you, but um, 
the you you run a blog and you run Facebook and Twitter and social media channels. I think you're on Instagram as well. Um, when um, years ago, I did I I, I worked um, I, I was doing some back and forth collaboration with you and with Kristen, your executive director, and uh, I had uh, we wanted to mobilize and activate the your blogger network and uh, the 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 comment that Kristen gave me was the most effective way you tend to have back then was to post something on your blog rather than sending out an email or a call to action to ask your network to pick things up because they were just coming to your blog and getting that information on their own. Is that the case still? Um, the case today is that our networks are overlapping and so um, email is now and still, you know, one of the best ways to reach a large number number of people at once and get them to take action. But there are a lot of people that we interact with, you know, who may just visit our blog or who we just interact with on Twitter, for example, or who are just, you know, fans on our Facebook page. Um, and so that's why we engage not just in social media but throughout the organization in what we call a layer cake organizing strategy. Um, to give people an opportunity to interact with us wherever they are, you know, kind of be where they are, meet them where they are, um, have the conversation where they're ready to have it, and, you know, not force them to come to a certain platform at a certain time to take an right. action. You want to be On as demand. As possible. Right. How, how, what, what's, a, what's a typical response rate and engagement rate that you get when you post something on the blog or post something on social media? You know, are you getting hundreds of people interacting with it? Are you getting thousands? Does it depend on the on the post? It's, it's such a range. It is such a range. And there are so many factors that go into it. If we're talking about something that is, you know, current headlines, top of mind, everybody else in the nation is also talking about it, and we're sharing a personal story, you know, thousands and thousands of people may interact, you know, may share a post or may share their own story. Um, you know, or take action in some way. Um, you know, having having a, a news hook definitely helps, or you know, a legislative hook, or um, you know, that that kind of opportunity, that moment when we're really um, sharing in the conversation that lots of people are already having. So, without getting too deep into it now, because we think we'll talk about it a lot more later in the second half of the show. And if you want to stick around and chime in, that would be great during our trending and politics section. But obviously the big news hook right now is the resurgence of the whole issue of um, sexual assault against women. Uh, have you been getting involved in that conversation? Uh, and if so, what to what end? That's a great question. Um, we have been actually, since before that particular conversation um, emerged, um, Moms Rising has been doing advocacy work you know, for years. Gloria can speak to this too on um, issues of domestic violence and assault. And more recently, um, with regards to this uh, election cycle, this campaign cycle in particular, um, we've been focusing on how the toxic rhetoric um, that we've seen um, has been really damaging to to folks and you know people who want to share the whole experience of democratic participation with their kids and feel like just completely disgusted and turned off by it. Um, and we have partnered with other organizations um, who are standing up to, you know, kind of call out the media complicity in amplifying um, some of these messages. Um, and, and so that's the level that we have been right. engaged in. You've got campaign concerns that you, you know, don't want to get too distracted from. And trust me, I, I know what it's like to go down the rabbit hole of this, these particular election issues. I get stuck in it all the time. Uh, so I'm going to bring Gloria up, Anita, but just if you have a comment that you want to chime in on, there's the ability to uh, raise your hand 
uh, on the screen. That'll put a question mark on your box, and I'll be able to pop you back up on screen to get you. Uh, so by all means, anytime you have a particular question or comment that you want to add, just let me know, and I will come back to you again back and forth uh, uh, throughout the, the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, but I just want to let you know that if you want to jump in, just let me know. Um, okay, so I am going to get Gloria up here. There's Gloria. Swapping now. And welcome to the stage, Gloria Pan. Hello, Gloria. How are you? I'm good. Hey, Alan. It's nice to see you again. And uh, why don't you tell us uh, your role with, uh, with Moms Rising? I am the National Campaign Director for Gun Safety. And I also have responsibility for the child nutrition reauthorization. Okay. And well, so, I also have responsibility for member growth. Member growth. So your 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 is how much of member growth is just straight out join us and how much of it is through the campaigns and participation in the campaigns as a vehicle to join the the, the, the community? Oh, it, it's very much engaging the community and getting people to come on board. Okay, so to be a member, what does it take to be a member of Moms Rising? Well, it's it's well, anybody, we consider anybody who cares about the future of this country and who has a belly button and, and, and wants the next generation to thrive to be a member of Moms Rising. But, um, but when we say member of Moms Rising, we're actually talking about people who engage with us through our email list and also through our social media network, which we estimate to be about five, five million now. Excellent, excellent. So uh, by belly button, you mean that Adam and Eve would not be welcome? Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I Eve was... Looking. I had to stop for a second there. Eve was a mom, so maybe you should uh, make an exception for them. So, mm -hmm. uh, all right, so let's move on on that. Uh, or uh, on, And I want to talk a little bit about um, the campaigns that you're doing. You're... The big campaign you see you're working on right now is the gun safety campaign, correct? Yes. So tell us about what you're trying to accomplish in this campaign. Okay. So um, it is a very intense campaign. And let me just start by saying that um, Moms Rising actually didn't join the gun fight until 2012 um, when the Newtown shootings happened. And this is actually an excellent illustration of how we are a responsive organization and we very much have our ear to the ground in terms of what is top of mind for moms and family members across the country in any given moment. So um, the Newtown shootings where we saw uh, 20 first graders shot to death and also six educators um, was a profound moment for our country. And um, you know, Moms Rising, our, our own team, when it happened, we watched it together and there was such grief among us. But then immediately we started hearing from our members from across the country via email, via social media. This is awful. My heart is breaking. I have children that age. What can we do? What can we do? How can we help Moms Rising to make sure something like this never happens again? And so in response to that incredible outpouring of grief um, and the, the demand for action, through the collective voice of Moms Rising, that's how we entered the gun fight. Interesting. Okay. So it was really an activation of moms and dads. Yes, absolutely. And um, we we have a very specific uh, policy goals that we would love to see happen. We yes. um, we are for universal background checks. Right now, there are a lot of loopholes. If you go and buy a gun, there are many ways of doing it without um, getting a background check, and there are irresponsible people who are jumping through those loopholes. So we're for universal background checks. We're also for um, real penalties for straw purchase, purchasing. So I may not be allowed to buy a gun, but if you are Alan and you go and buy one for me right now, there are very few penalties for that, but we believe there should be very strong penalties for that. And finally, we believe that um, people should just, should just not have access to militarized um, uh, high capacity uh, I'm sorry, militarized weapons, uh, assault weapons, and high capacity magazines. So those are our three policy priorities. But we're also in the business of trying to um, bring about culture change so that um, we can bring about common sense uh, solutions to gun violence. 
Now, the, the first thing or a couple things that strike me about this policy agenda is, number one, you're not trying to take guns away from people. Nope. You're, you're trying to make sure that guns are purchased responsibly and kept out of the hands of dangerous people. Yes. Which is, you know, it's 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 really not a black and white fight. It's it's very funny. The the you know we um, and our policy partners, you know, we're trying to find real solutions that would cut into the terrible gun violence epidemic that we have right now in this country. Um, hundred thousand people, hundred thousand Americans are shot every year. Thirty three thousand are killed. Many of those are children, and there must be ways that we can cut back on it. We have the highest gun violence rate among developed nations by far. And um, when we propose these solutions, um, the gun lobby and the other side are automatically like, no, no solutions. But it's really, it's not a black and white fight. We are not against the Second Amendment. We're not talking about repealing uh, gun rights. We're just talking about sensible solutions so that we can save lives. I think I think that that's a really important point that gets lost in all of the political rhetoric, and uh, you know there's there's a lot of activity going on on the other side trying to make it sound like we are or this position is the is is uh, is out to take everybody's guns and it's creating a lot of fear and reaction in ways that make people think that organizations like you are actually advocating for things that you're not advocating for. Uh, that's so. Right. I think it's always important to, to really kind of push home that message. So in this particular case, you know, let's talk a little bit about how you get that message out. Um, my understanding is that Moms Rising is 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 really fixated and focused on testing its messaging to make sure it has the most effective wording, the most effective targeting in order to get people to respond very effect, uh, in high rates to, to the actions that you, uh, that you take. Can you talk a little bit about how you go about doing that? Sure. And um, I, Anita, I hope that you jump in okay, when you can. Um, so, you know, right now, we, we are all flooded with information. There is just like too much information. So the way that we try to communicate a message is through layer cake organizing, which Anita has talked about already before, talk, uh, touched upon. And that includes um, things like using our email list. It means um, direct contact with lawmakers and bringing our message directly to lawmakers. Um, it means you know outreach to um, online and also traditional news media, among other things. Okay. And so, and then on top of that, we also have to have a really good message. So it starts with, um, when we start um, a campaign, it starts with message testing via our email list. And um, before we send anything out, you know, we, we figure out what we're gonna write, what kind of message, dear Alan, you know, it's not, you know, please help me fight for background checks. There's gonna be a little bit more than that. And then the subject line, of course, is really important. And we typically, test three to five to 10, depending on um, really? what the topic is. And we send it out there and we let those sit for a while and then we pick the winning one and then we send that one out. But of course it also depends on what time of day that we decide to send something out because that varies too. And then on top of that, once we send an email out and most of our messaging is in that email, um, we adjust it and we adapt it to the rest of our uh, social media channels. All right, I'm going to bring Anita up to uh, to talk a little bit more about this. Excuse me? I'm sorry, I'm going to bring Anita up to, to add, because um, I want to get some sense of the social media testing as well. Welcome back, Anita. Um, Thank you. So tell, um, Gloria talked about the email testing, taking you know uh, up to 10 messages and sending uh, it out to a small segment of your list and then seeing how long uh, how well they respond and then running with the one that works the best um typically how long do you wait before you you, you follow up and pick pick one again that depends too um it depends on when we send the initial test um you know it can be and depending on what kind of rush we're in what right. kind of rapid response moment it could be anywhere from like an hour to a day um, Very so, good. And, um, and, and to what extent are you using the blog and your social media channels to test your messages as well? The, um, 
Well, social media provides kind of the quickest feedback. Um, the, the messages that we share on social media really reflect the messages that go out over email because those are so rigorously tested and vetted. Um, you know, part of the message development is going to policy partners and working with them to see what the, you know, the latest messaging is um, to make sure that we're not stepping on toes, that we're not, that we're using the most up-to-date language, um, you know, and to make sure that we are framing our message in the strongest way possible. So after all that um, hard work is being done, we definitely want to reflect that in our social media messaging and not kind of reinvent the wheel. Um, and that's been pretty successful for us. Um, you know, in terms of the, the, the thing, one thing that our email messages do really well that I try to re have us as a team reflect in our social media messaging is translating um, the policy language into language that's going to resonate with grassroots people who are outside the Beltway. And um, we do that often with personal stories, using personal stories that um, illustrate a policy really well and then sharing that on social media as well. So re developing messages that reflect well and perform well outside the Beltway is a very important and interesting goal, and particularly for Moms Rising, because you are a virtual organization. You don't all live in the same place. How many people work for Moms Rising, and uh, how many states are you located in based on the distribution of where people are living? Well, we have, you know, with a million members, we have members in every state. Um, right. And staff-wise at this point? Uh, staff-wise, um, we are pretty well distributed through the country. We have, um, I think we're up to, Gloria, correct me if I'm wrong, we're up to like 40 staff members now. Um, we also have, you know, consultants that we work with. And we, um, you know, yeah, we're from coast to coast and in between so um, that and and the it, it, I think it's important to point out that we also do have a mom's meetup program so that um, you know we're having meetups regularly on the ground in various states um, and the staffers who are there who are organizing those um, report back in on you know what the conversation is and what's resonating with people on the ground. So uh, so that structure is very very useful to really kind of get a head start on figuring out what messages might work outside the Beltway and yeah. make sure that you have one that really takes off out of the uh, out of the ten or so that you are testing. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, right. So that's the, the balance that we always have to strike is making sure that our policy messaging is correct. And, you know, like, it's, it's, it's really important. You would be surprised, you know, I think, to, to see how many messages go out from, you know, from your friends and family and kind of like non-wonks to even other organizations that's not going to work on the Hill when you're talking to legislators. You know, they're going to be like, oh, that's yesterday's news or we're not working on that or that's, you know. Right, so right. being really careful about the policy messaging huh. is super important. Um, but having a handle on what the grassroots um, conversation really is, is equally important. So balance sure. those two become the crucial activity. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I would suspect that based on this, this, this really is at the crux of why you've been so successful at turning your campaign and the messaging from your campaigns into actions and member recruitment and legislation. Yes, it really is a lot of um, listening. Social listening is a big part of our social media strategy. Um, you know, it's essential that we're not just a bullhorn out like a one way Right. thing, you know, one way bullhorn. Um, you know, I, I try to remind our staff and they do a great job of working together to to, you know, really grab hold of this strategy of social listening. 
um, and really yeah, integrate it. Eyes all over the place reporting back to you from your staff and probably from your members as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, from we have folks in New Hampshire and North Carolina that I'm thinking of in particular um, who are really active in terms of um, organizing, getting together, reaching out to their community, and then taking what they hear back to their um, state legislators and their Congress people. Excellent. Well, I think uh, Gloria has a comment, so I'm going to swap you guys. Soon we will have an, a third window up here to have three people up at once. Hey, Gloria, welcome back. Hi. So uh, you, had a, you had a comment. I did. I just wanted to um, um, re-emphasize um, Anita's uh, comment that um, our, gra our grassroots is just as important. Um, you know, Moms Rising, we're known for our online power. We were founded as an internet-based organization. But as we've grown and as we've really started to um, see what works and affect change, we have found that actually um, some of our most powerful campaigns have been because we have such a strong relationship with our grassroots and our members. And across the country, we may not have staff in every state, but we have members in every state. And our um, relationship with some of our members is so strong that actually I would say that sometimes it's hard to tell the line between staff and our members. And so the grassroots aspect of it, the real life connection with people on the ground is just as important, if not more important, if only because, as we said before, um, it's just so noisy in, in, on the Internet these days. Digitally, things are just so noisy that when you really can have that human connection, that sometimes is the most powerful thing of all. Let me ask you, what do you think is the secret sauce? Is it the set of issues that you're focused on? Is it your targeting of moms as a, as a primary audience? Um, is it the virtual marriage with the, the offline? What do you think is the, is the driving force that, that has made Moms Rising so successful? Um, I, okay, so Anita might be in a better position to answer this only because she has been with them from the very beginning, okay? I joined about five years ago. Um, but I've been watching Moms Rising since the beginning. You and I did that together, Alan. Mm -hmm. um, so as, as somebody who's been observing Moms Rising from the beginning and who's now working, I would say that part of the secret sauce is the fact that we really are moms. <laughs> the people who founded <laughs> Moms yeah. Rising, it, it arose from a, a real need in their own personal lives. You know, Kristen and Joan Blades, I mean, they saw it in their own lives. They saw it in their communities, the need for family economic security and policies that really support families. They saw it, they were experiencing it themselves. And as they grew the movement and they grew Moms Rising and our staff, the people who came on board, we live these issues just like our members do. And I think that that's actually maybe the most important ingredient in our secret sauce that, you know, we are a professional advocacy organization, but the people who work here are the people who, who populate it and make us move forward. We, we serve ourselves as well as our members. Right. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to bring Anita up here to, uh, uh, to, to chime in on that question. Anita, so what do you think? Is, that, is it because of the moms or is there something else or is it moms plus? I think it's, I think, it's moms plus. I think Gloria is right that um, this this grew so quickly and so organically because the voice was totally authentic, you know, and because we were, you know, this is kind of, this is related to what Gloria said, but I think it's maybe like a slightly an addition um, is that moms rising addressed the whole person and it just you know came at a time you know, I, I think before moms rising it was really hard to find an organization that saw a mom as a whole person and saw all of these um, issues integrated you know so you know i might i might sign a petition from an organization that's just focused on paid sick days or just focused on equal pay but to have an organization say that I see you and all the things that you're struggling with, 
from the beginning of your day when you have to figure out childcare, you know, to the middle of the day when you're facing harassment in the workplace and knowing that you're earning a lower salary than your coworker, to the end of the day when you're on second shift and you know maybe you don't have a partner at home or maybe your partner comes home and you know you're it's on you to pick up the kids and you know figure out like dinner and what to do the next day. I think there was just such a feeling of relief. At least that's how it was for me. You know, I saw I saw the showing of the Motherhood Manifesto documentary um, that Joan Blades happened to be at. And as soon it was as it was over, I went up to her and I said, How how can I volunteer for this organization? Because it was just it was so amazing to me that not only could an organization recognize that we face all of these issues at once, but that they Moms Rising, you know, is willing to uh, talk about those issues in a way that makes sense to legislators and effectively advocate for multiple issues at once, um, kind of bringing up the, you know, the whole ship. I don't know exactly how to say, you know, like kind of showing how they're all integrated, really related, um, I think has been a really effective way to accelerate the forward motion for all of these policies. So I have to say, I know you, you're just celebrating your 10th anniversary, which is fantastic for Moms Rising, but given what you just said, the idea that it's only been 10 years since there's been an organization expressing the these issues in a holistic appreciation for moms as a person and as a vital part of society, you know, that's that's not long enough. It should have, we should have been here decades ago, um, but thankfully uh, we're, we're getting there now. Uh, yeah. You know, I think uh, when you talk about whole person, it seems like part of that is, uh, you know, for a long time and even still among some people, uh, it's hard to get them to acknowledge the work that moms do running a household, raising kids as work. You know? Yes, right. That's just that you know, absurd given the amount of effort it takes compared to some jobs out there. Uh, but certainly, you know, it's comparable to, to the most demanding job out there, so. It is labor. And, and I, you know, I think it is also no coincidence that Moms Rising's rise happened over the last 10 years, you know, kind of in tandem with a rise in, in social media um, tools and, you know, a rise in use of the Internet to tell personal stories and to amplify individuals, you know, stories. Um, you know, I, I think there are other organizations who've also taken some of this on, but I think um, it really helped us to have a co-founder who came from a background that really um, understood what online organizing meant, in and addition to on the ground organizing. You referred to Joan Blades, who came from Move On, right. um, and uh, she and her husband were co-founders of that organization. So yeah. Um, the, uh, and even, you know, I guess Joan has been very, very much involved in uh, pioneering and mapping out what a virtual organization looks like and Moms Rising is and Move On are both prime examples of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, is it true that you're discouraged from having two people in the same office at the same time? That's a West thing, Joan's husband. That you know, um, I think he felt like that would um, cause people to form cliques. Um, I don't. I don't know that we have that formally. Um, Gloria works in a, a section of the country where there are several Moms Rising staffers together. I don't know how often do you guys get together, Gloria? Well, let's bring her up <laughs> and ask. In, uh... in California. Yeah. All right, uh, Gloria. I want to. I want to ask you that question. Uh, and you are on screen now. Uh, do you ever get to uh, get together and work in the same room with some of the local Moms Rising staff here in the DC metro area? No, we never get together to work in the same room, but we frequently get together to go to Congress and demand action. We do that together a lot. All right, all right. So you know when it when it when it when it matters when you need that that sort of you know, strength in numbers, you, you bring it together. Yes. Uh, now, you guys are connected to each other, even though you're all in separate locations. 
you're connected. Are you, what do you Slack and Skype and things like that? Um, we use all sorts of platforms. Um, you know, we we IM, we email, we text each other, we phone each other. You know, whatever, whatever works. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So before we wrap this section up and go on to the our trending and politics segment, I have to ask you, since I asked Anita, um, what is your reaction to the tone and developments of the presidential election with respect to the resurgence of all this focus on sexual assault and violence against women? I think actually it's been really great for the fight um, to reduce violence against women. Actually, um, October is National um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Yeah. So um, this actually has been a great opportunity to, to really bring this up into the public discussion and to talk about what exactly constitutes um, sexual violence or violence against women and, um, and the culture that surrounds it and enables it. So, uh, you know, we, earlier we were talking about that you, you doing work on, on gun safety issues and and the way Donald Trump has been describing his behavior and what's, you know, it isn't that kind of violence, but it's still violence. And how do you make people understand that even if it's not shooting someone or punching someone, that this kind of groping and inappropriate sexual advances, that that is a violent interference with that other person? Um, I think it all starts with respect. If you don't have enough respect to even speak to a woman and behave appropriately with a woman, then um, how are you going to um, physically treat her with respect? I mean, I, I think it starts from there. It's all about enabling and a sense of power also. Um, the abuser feels a sense of power that he can speak to a woman that way. And I think that's the same well from which a physical abuser gets his sense of power also. Yeah, so uh, it's all part of a larger package, and mm -hmm. you know, once you cross a line, you know, you can go way past that line, but once you cross that line, you've crossed a line of violating the law, disrespecting uh, women, and and just being completely and utterly inappropriate and in acting illegally. And I think yes. uh, people need to think, you know, to understand that that line is a lot closer. Uh, to uh, to where they may see normal than 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 they might have otherwise thought. Uh, I think it's an important thing for us to be focused on as a society. So with that, I just want to say thank you very much, Gloria. Thank you very much, Anita. This has been fantastic. Please uh, stick around and chime in on the conversation if you have time. Uh, if you are interested in uh, getting involved with Moms Rising, they're on the web at momsrising.org. Uh, they're also on uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and probably elsewhere, too. Uh, do you have a Pinterest account? Maybe. Yes, we do. Yes, you do. All right. And uh, um, they've got a lot, lot, lot of campaigns going on, a lot of good information, a lot of good meetups going on around town, and uh, I highly recommend it. Any final comments, Gloria? Or Anita, if you've got a final comment, just throw, throw up your hand. Gloria, anything? You all set? Yeah, I'm all set. Thanks for having us, Alan. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. And thanks for coming out and spending a, a good chunk of your afternoon with us. Really appreciate it. Take care. And uh, now we're going to move on and talk about uh, talk about the um, trending in politics. So I'm going to bring up uh, my if I can find him. There you go, Ken. Ken, my producer, Ken Bazinet, former White House correspondent for New York Daily News. Uh, and uh, now working at uh, as a communication strategist, as I do, and um, trying to hit that. There we go. Hello, Ken. How are you? How are you? I'm good. I see you, you put a tie on for me today. No, I came out of a meeting. I didn't put a tie on, so I'm still wearing a tie. I'm hurt. I'm hurt. That was an awesome segment. Um, I have to pass on uh, kudos, especially for my wife, who is uh, sitting in the room with me, who was just blown away by both of those presentations. And uh, I uh, sense we'll be getting in touch with your organization uh, sooner than later. Uh, it was uh, uh, very, very uplifting and uh, 
uh, as uh, Alan, uh, the point that Alan uh, uh, made, uh, an organization well overdue. And congratulations and thank you for all you do for all of us, quite frankly. Yeah, my, my sentiments exactly. I have long been a been a fan of Moms Rising and um, have had many opportunities over the years to collaborate with them and uh, celebrate with them and uh, amplify their voices whenever I can and uh, and always with great pleasure to do so, even if the issues they're fighting for aren't always creating pleasure because of the, the, the real problems that we're trying to address. Exactly. Hey, why is my picture foggy today? I don't know. You always. I think you probably I'm have much better looking than this. I think it's the soft lens. It makes you look, you know, more like Barbara Walters. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so uh, let's start with um, the uh, government. The FBI has basically said that they are convinced that the hacking of the emails of uh, of Podesta of the Hillary campaign of the DNC and the break-ins, the ha hackings of the Illinois, Florida, and Arizona election systems were orchestrated by the Russians. Yep, uh, we sort of uh, saw that coming. The denials out of Moscow are uh, very uh, uh, subtle confirmations, I think. And, uh, you know, what's really interesting is listening to Trump defenders actually taking Putin's side. It's, it's breathtaking. One thing that I picked up yesterday on Twitter was the fact that Rush Limbaugh, because as you can probably imagine, I don't listen to Rush Limbaugh, but, but Rush Limbaugh actually made a defense of this in order to obviously protect you know, his candidate, Donald Trump. And I can't help but think we're now listening to influencers making a case for a re-emerging, for lack of a better term, enemy, or perhaps soft, soft enemy. Um, you know, we're having this return to a soft uh, uh, Cold War. But in either case, because of Russian inter uh, adventurism right now, we have American troops and our allies that are in harm's way right. in several theaters of conflict uh, around the globe and now we're actually hearing conservatives if not republicans defending putin and to me you know that is more stunning than the fact that the russians are hacking us or that the chinese have hacked us right. or the unspoken elephant in the room that our government hacks them Right, right. And, and, you know, if you look at the chain here, it's, you know, the, the way I, I'm reading it, it's Russian, high-level Russian officials working with Guccifer 2.0 to hack this information, and then they're giving that information to WikiLeaks, and then WikiLeaks, Assange, uh, Julian Assange, is talking with Roger Stone, one of uh, Trump's top, adv top advisors, and giving him heads up on the information that will be coming. And Trump is develop Trump campaign is developing messaging strategy and tactics based on this for forewarning from this collusory collusion relationship between WikiLeaks, Guccifer, and the Russian government in order to drive his campaign. So it's more than it seems to be, and you know this is enough steps that you can say, oh, it's, it, you know, it's just coincidental or, but it, it seems to be that there is a collusion that connects the Trump campaign with the Russian government's efforts here um, with a lot of steps that allow for plausible deniability. Yeah, it's, it's obviously an allegation. Nothing is conclusive yet, right. uh, you know, regarding, uh, you know, Everything happens so quickly, and if you have any decent level of research ability, you can move rather, you know, rapidly to take advantage of these things. So it could be a, a coincidence. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking in, uh, you know, uh, trying to avoid liability here, obviously. Right, right. I, I mean, this is, the, the, the connections are, are troubling. It's mm -hmm. all, a lot of it is conjecture, but to be honest, 
the conjecture is a lot more solid than your typical speculating on the news that you get on typical news channels. You know, three quarters of the broadcasts we get every day. Everything is plausible. The other thing is I have a um, what I refer to as a spooky source, someone who is uh, in the intelligence community who now is saying there's evidence being developed that Guccifer 2.0 is actually a, I apologize for that, is actually a, um, uh, a, a member of the Russian intelligence community. It's not that he's working with necessarily, again, an allegation. In either case, what we're talking about here is potentially treasonous, if you really think about it. I mean, we are in a position right now with Moscow where we are not exactly uh, in a cooperative relationship. Uh, and again, you know, there are American, you know, women and men whose lives are on the line uh, in different uh, theaters of conflict around the globe who, you know, I think first and foremost, that's what concerns me. Yeah. And yet somehow in the craziest election of our adult lives, you know, save for maybe whatever happened in 2000, but certainly that was a polite conversation compared to this, uh, you know, it's breathtaking. It's, it's just breathtaking to see, you know, you know, where this has gone and, uh, you know, the potential, uh, you know, the, 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 what we need right now are people to begin to talk about how we're going to come together as a nation and as a society. And these events are simply events that continue, continue to, to widen, you know, uh, the canyon uh, between, you know, Americans on each side of this debate. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to bring Ben up here for a moment. I want to uh, kind of switch gears a little bit. Not so. It's still a continuation of this topic. But uh, but Ben, um, at the same time that all this stuff is coming out, you know, and Putin's making the argument that yeah, it doesn't matter that if whether or not we were behind it, which is of course absurd. What matters is the content of these emails and and how terrible it makes it look that you know Hillary Clinton is saying that she, uh, is talking to Wall Street and saying how you know she she she's she likes free trade. You know, like that's a surprise to anybody. Um, but they're not getting any traction on this in the news because all anybody wants to talk about is Donald Trump's, um, you know, TMZ video about uh, bragging about sexual assault. And then this uh, onslaught, I think we're up to like six women now that have come out and said, yes, he did this to me. And he's arguing back and forth, denying it and all this stuff. Uh, what's the balance here? You're, you're, you're the media analyst, uh, you know, that I always like to talk to about these things. You know, how do you, how do you break through the noise? Is there any way for the Trump's message about the content of these emails or Putin's message about the content of these emails uh, to break through this sexual harassment, uh, you know, scandal that, that Trump is stuck in? Well, I think obviously Trump clearly needs to change his his pace. I mean, he seems to be fueling his own demise, you know, if you really want to sort of look behind the curtain of something like this. You know, you know, so one day after another, somebody comes in, he doubles down, triples down and creates his own story. I mean, that's been how he's run this campaign. So the irony is, is that he might be telling his own demise. I mean, that would be the maybe the most interesting thing of this campaign that I would love to see is watching Trump destroy himself while nobody else could. Yeah, so, you know, the sacks are off, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. And let, let me make one comment here, too, about WikiLeaks, because I think it's relevant. Yes. First of all, a song like yes. his whole point in WikiLeaks is to demand transparency. I mean, that, that is the theory of WikiLeaks. And, and if you really dig into the Snowden WikiLeaks, they are sort of at, at loggerheads in terms of like how to do this, when to do this, how to do this. Um, and I think there's different, you know, different reasoning behind them. But the irony is in WikiLeaks and Assange's approach is that we don't see anything coming out about Russia, nothing. 
And to me, it seems very strange, you know, that here we are, if we really look at Putin, even on the topical level, the type of chaos that this leader is, 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 is you know, residing over out there. Um, it, it strikes me as ironic, you know, to the nth degree that of all the people on the planet that he would attack, it, it, it would be Putin. It would be the Russian, you know, the hierarchy up there, the oligarchs, these people. Yet we don't hear any of it. So we see this consistent barrage of information being, you know, directly intervening into a United States election, clearly being, you know, put out there. Podesta was threatened months ago with this information being leaked, by the way. So, you know, we, we have a we have like a real pattern here that, you know, from my perspective, they are attacking these people specifically. It's very possible that these emails could be altered. Um, to believe this stuff, hook, line, and sinker, to me, is faulty. It is not the way we report news in this country. And the irony is maybe, and maybe this is wishful thinking, but maybe the population out there is seeing too much of this. And it is clear that the Russians and Assange are attacking this country. And I wonder for the people, whether you're left or you're right, if you really want to believe that this is true. And I, I just don't, I don't see it. I'm starting after this whole new dump with the Podesta things. I've been pouring over this stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're talking about every minority, like every nook and cranny. They're talking about every, every opponent, you know, that, you know, of their campaign. It just seems almost unbelievable to me at this point that this stuff could just be true 100% because some person, whether it's a, KGB plan or whoever it is, like could just be getting all this information and just, you know, dumping it into this election sort of strategically like this. I can't believe that the right, even the Tea Party out there would sit here and just be like, oh yeah, here we are. We finally have more information from Putin to destroy Hillary Clinton. It's just unbelievable to me that even the right, specifically the Tea Party, you know, groups out there would, would buy this stuff. So, you know, I mean, look, clearly there's emails being hacked. Clearly information is being stolen. Do I, as a citizen, as a media watcher out there, really believe that this is just true? I can't believe it. I, I'm starting to not believe all this information, especially since a song's goal is transparency. This is not transparency. This is yeah. not being transparent. This is a one-sided attack that I think is, you know, really orchestrated, whether it's by the Russians or whoever it is. It's clearly an attack being designed to, you know, attack the campaign, if not to directly affect the election. And I think that to me is what the story is here, how it is affecting the election, which brings me to your point about Trump is the irony is instead of capitalizing on this, I find himself constantly, like he's done month after month, but in this case, shooting himself in the foot. So I, I, I would be not surprised if we watch Trump eat himself alive. Right. All right. I'm going to bring Ken up, but while he's while he's coming up, I want to speak to Ben's comment about um, about the um, the transparency and the in in how much of it may be doctored or not. Interestingly, as I mentioned, I think in the first episode, uh, one of my emails was snared in the DNC WikiLeaks um, dump, uh, an email that I had sent to the communications director there. And it was an email that I had sent. It was a really simple, straightforward. I said, you know, oh, you're going the, doc the dangerous Donald. Um, uh, hashtag that sounds good i've been having a lot of fun with the trumpster diving hashtag and that was the extent of the email there wasn't a whole lot to it it was very conversational in response to an email that uh, they had sent me um and uh uh and that email inconsequential email was accurate it really was an email i sent it got picked up by a bunch of trump trolls who started a attacking me by social media email phone calls uh and uh, and and very quickly they started calling me racial you know uh, slurs against me being jewish uh you know it was it was really you know an all-out barrage for a week or two um 
But it seems to me that if you keep most of the emails that are being leaked at, um, unaltered and just alter a few, you can create the sense that this is all legitimate and all accurate and then slip through some doctored ones potentially. So to Ben's point, um, we don't know what, what, what has been altered and what has not been altered. Um, and, uh, um, and a lot of the stuff that has not been altered um, isn't really very consequential. And, and as I said, a lot of the stuff that is coming out now about Hillary's uh, speeches before, um, before the Wall Street banks, who's surprised by the content you know everybody's been accusing her of these kinds of you know being um pro big business for for really decades and so the idea that there are emails that show that she is sympathetic towards big business to some degree makes a lot of sense it's also doesn't rule out that she has other more progressive viewpoints that can mesh nicely with that maybe not to the level that uh, the far left would like, and certainly, um, you know, giving fodder to the far right. But I'm not sure, you know, it's not quite the same as President, as, as Donald Trump getting caught on tape bragging about committing uh, sexual harassment, which is a crime. I just don't see the equivalence there. Uh, Ken, you're up. A new topic. Um, yes. This one is red hot today uh, on Twitter. and. Uh, uh, the other social media platforms. Um, Fox Business News host Lou Dobbs, mm. they tweeted out personal information of one of the women who had accused Trump of uh, inappropriate uh, sexual contact. Um, Twitter has just lit up, uh, basically calling for his firing over the doxing. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it the, uh, as you can imagine, uh, I don't think this is going to go away rather quickly. I mean, think about that for a second. You're talking about a another influencer, an anchor for Fox Business News, putting out, you know, uh, a name, a phone number, uh, yeah. and oh, just completely destroying a person's privacy. Now, um, supposedly he deleted it, but that you know, once it's out there, it's it's loaded up into everybody's. Uh, into everybody's uh, cash. It, it, you can't really delete that. Right, right. He actually tweeted the address and phone number, but nonetheless, I mean, you can imagine. Um, uh, some of the uh, tweets I have right here in front of me, um, men like Lou Dobbs who are again attacking these women, dot, 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 uh, and then it goes on to explain, Lou Dobbs must be fired for doxing a sexual assault victim. Uh, disgusting that Lou Dobbs tweets Trump's accuser's address and phone number. So that's an example of the outpouring that we that we have out there. And quite frankly, um, I agree with everything that Ben said about uh, WikiLeaks. I believe that Assange is behaving um, with malice. Uh, and, and I use that as a legal term, uh, attacking certain people who have differences with him and that's why he's not given us the broader picture. However, these kind of incidents involving Trump are really damping down any kind of coverage that you could, you know, really see over WikiLeaks. I mean, it's really hard to, to imagine any of the WikiLeaks material that's out there cutting through this kind of uh, incident involving uh, Lou Dobbs. And then obviously um, the actual victims coming forward now. Uh, accusing Trump, so it's a it, again, it's a it's a breathtaking moment in uh, our modern campaign history. Now, of course, I've also seen tweets that say, you know, if we're going to believe the accusers of Donald Trump, shouldn't we equally believe the accusers of Bill Clinton? And you know, there's a legitimate case to be made for that, but Bill Clinton's not running for president, and Donald Trump is. Yeah, I'm not touching that. <laughs> Well, um, you know, I think uh, it, it is it is fast. And this idea of re releasing the name, address, and contact information of a victim, you know, this is something that our justice system, our judicial system would not do. 
They protect victims from this for exactly the same kind of reasons that Dobbs did it in the first place. You don't release that kind of information the way he released it unless you're trying to get people to use that information to harass her, to threaten her, to to uh, you know potentially do bodily harm to her. I mean that oh. is just crazy. Oh, I think a, I think a crime was committed here. Um, uh one way or another and i think that uh, uh we will potentially uh see some follow up from either the justice department or uh if he's in you know i think he's based in new york state uh they have a very aggressive attorney general there yes. um i'm sure that there are you know legal forces right now uh going through this and and uh lou dobbs lawyer up well, you know, Lou Dobbs this is no stranger to uh, being attacked and forced out of a job. You know, back uh, um, early on when he was on CNN and going on and on and on about uh, um, really precursor to a lot of Donald Trump's comments about Mexican immigrants. Uh, you were getting those same kind of messages from Lou Dobbs, uh, and uh, he was being challenged for his racist comments about Mexican immigrants, Mexican undocumented uh, immigrants. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, maybe a, a quick story and then we'll wrap it up for, for the day. Um, but there was a, um, a campaign to get rid of Lou Dobbs. Uh, there was a, a, a Spanish language version called Basta Dobbs that, that, that was involved with this. But one of the interesting early innovations with regard to uh, online campaigns is two weeks before the campaign to get rid of Dobbs launched, uh, the campaign basically took out a series of Facebook ads that were targeted only at CNN employees. Mm -hmm. And every day they would log on to Facebook and they would see a little ad on the sidebar with a picture of one of their colleagues, Wolf Blitzer, Soledad O'Brien, who was there at the time. And it would say, hey, Wolf, what's it like working with a racist? Dump, uh, dump Lou Dobbs. And then the next day it was like, hey, Soledad, what's it like working with a racist? Dump Lou Dobbs. And this went on for two weeks, targeting only CNN but as far, employees. But as far as they were concerned, they didn't know it was only being targeted against them. They just thought, oh, my God, there's this massive ad campaign uh, to get rid of Lou Dobbs. And when the campaign dropped, instead of giving it two minutes in a story and then moving on to the next one, they gave it two weeks' worth of coverage. And by the end of it, Lou Dobbs was history and moved and moved on and crowned a home at Fox Business ultimately. So um, Lou Dobbs should be, you know, the fact that he got himself in the hot water once again for this kind of behavior, you know, it's like, you know, shame me once, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice. And it's a variation of that, I think. You, you know? almost pulled a George W. Bush there. Yes, like shame me once. <laughs> That's right. Uh, in fact, I think we're shaming him twice here. So. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the, uh, uh, the, I think that, you know, you, you probably picked up on some of these rumors that Trump and, and uh, Roger Ailes might uh, very well start a network or right. some, you know, uh, some it asset. seems like, you know, I can tell you who they might just want to recruit for their first anchor, and we'll leave it at Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. You know, him and David Duke, right? Because, you, know? you know, he won't be winning his election. All right, so um, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ben. Thanks to Anita and Gloria from Moms Rising. Uh, we are going to wrap things up here on the Dr. Digipol show. Uh, once again, we are... Uh, um, happy uh, about uh, another good show in the books i'm gonna load up our our exit music and i'm gonna say we'll see you next week on the dr digipol show bye bye <laughs>